you watching NewsX, my name is Vinny. The Ministry of External Affairs has said in an official statement that Sagar Vision is in action as neighborhood leaders have been invited to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's wedding and ceremony. India had launched its Sagar Vision in 2015 during Prime Minister Modi's visit to the Indian Ocean Island states of Seychelles, Mauritius and Sri Lanka. The idea behind the Sagar Vision is to fortify India's economic and security connections with its maritime neighbours as well as counter China to some extent. This reflects on Prime Minister Modi's attempt to South Asia first policy and increased efforts directed to strengthen bilateral ties with its neighbours as well. We'll discuss this in the next half an hour with our guest joining us on the show is Major General Gigi Dvedi, Global Strategic Defense Expert. Also joining us on the show is Ambassador Suresh Kumar Goyal, former diplomat. Mrs. Surinder Singh Lali, International Affairs Expert, also joins us on the program. Last but by no means the least, Mr. Pathikrit Pine, International Affairs, Ex uh, Affairs Expert, uh, also with us on the program. Ambassador Goyal, I'll begin with you. Well, how would you categorize and envision Sagar as? You know, it's also been called as an approach or a declaration of uh, national intent but the fact of the matter is a number of these neighbors you know have had problems with india they've they've had grouses with india but yet you know acting out of maturity and acting out of sheer prudence india still wants them at important levels including the prime minister's oath taking ceremony how do you view uh, this initiative as and of course the conceptual framework <laughs> has already yes. existed excuse me the conceptual framework has already been established and it's uh, up to them, at, uh, that's what these countries say, it's up to India actually to initiate it now. Uh, Vineet, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the show here. I think it's a very important discussion because uh, besides uh, the occasion being the oath taking ceremony of uh, Prime Minister Modi for the third term, uh, it's important for us to understand what India's geopolitical interests are and more than the interest really where we are situated in the region and as you mentioned yourself, what our interests are. Now the fact is that uh, looking at the history of Indian region and it is called Indian subcontinent for no reason, no other reason with the, with the exception that the politics of this region, South Asia and South Asia is ruled by or is influenced so deeply by India that I don't think that we can call it anything else but either Indian Peninsula or subcontinent, Indian subcontinent. So politically speaking, geographically speaking, if you look at all the countries in the region, the uh, I, I hate to use the word dependence, but the fact is that the political linkages and the historical linkages between these countries and India is so deep that I can't even think of security or well-being of one without the other, number one. And even more importantly, I think all of our neighbors, their own security and their own well-being progress would depend upon India to a very, very large extent. If you look at economy, trade, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, where, where will they be actually going but about India, but, but without India really, in terms of trade. In terms of security, can we think of this country's security without India? I can't even imagine this thing. And therefore, uh, I don't even think that we need to have going to a long explanation. And therefore, I would say one or two things here. It's important to let all these countries know that we are interested in developing good relations with them uh, it is actually, and uh, uh, I do think there is an exception here. Pakistan has not been invited. And I think, I don't think Pakistan would ever be invited unless we get a clear signal from Pakistan that their ways have changed, which we have not got so far, really. But uh, all these countries are important to us for our own uh, national interest, for our own economic growth. And it is also equally important to let them know that we are interested in carrying on forward this dialogue right from the beginning of the formation of the government till uh, all the time for, uh, for, for maintaining the growth as the saga really is all about growth for all, growth of all in the region. So I think an important uh, development, important 
It's not an initiative that has happened before, but an important step in terms of developing the regional security. We need. Absolutely, sir. Good points. And uh, General Devedi, well, Sagar is a geopolitical construct. Uh, it's meshed with the Sagar Mala. It's a project to improve domestic as well as uh, domestic maritime infrastructure and logistical capabilities. But it is not just that, General Devedi. This is also, uh, you know, has to do a lot with China and how China has dealt with the same very countries that are included in Sagar. Uh, absolutely, we need uh, first and foremost. We need to understand that uh, having good neighborly relationship, a good uh, conducive periphery is very important for every country and India is no exception. Uh, secondly, in South Asia, India is a pivot and uh, whether you take geographically, culturally, this region is very much interconnected. But historically, there are certain fault lines. Because of this, that kind of conducive atmosphere could not be ensured. Having said that, now, India is a regional power. It's a stabilizing factor, both politically, economically, and even if you take strategically. So, therefore, India has a strategic space and its national interest. There's, you know, it has been said that one who controls the seas would control the complete geopolitics of the region. So, now we have Indo-Pacific as a new construct. And Indo-Pacific, India has a very, very prominent place because Indo-Pacific concept cannot be orchestrated or realized without India. Now, having in that context, why is Indian Ocean so important? Because almost 30% of the global trade passes through Indian Ocean. The major oil pipelines are passing through this region. So therefore, willy-nilly, China has a very intimate interest because Chinese 70% of the oil is passing through this region. Now, when we take this into the context as to the invite to the South Asian nations, our neighborhood, with the exception of two countries, where it is a time to foster India's priority to the neighborhood, because India's first policy was initiated sometime in 2008, but Mr. Modi has taken pains to take it forward in 2014, when he was shown first time, he invited all the SARC nations, in second time in 2019, all the Binstech nations were invited and today uh, we have uh, uh, the next swearing ceremony which will be tomorrow, uh, seven of the important neighbors have been invited. So in a nutshell, what I would like to state that India is a stabilizing factor politically, economically, strategically. India has an interest in stability of the region. India has an interest that the neighbors grow because we have a policy of shared prosperity vis-a-vis -vis China, which actually exercises checkbook diplomacy and debt trap diplomacy. So therefore, world sees India as a balancing factor. We see ourselves also as a stabling factor. And China's shadow will loom large because China also considers South Asia as its backyard. And Indian Ocean region, its steep stating is not India's lake. So I think this initiative of inviting our friendly neighborhood countries is very important to foster our priority in the neighborhood and also it shows that we care for our friends both neighbor i mean near and far vinit hmm. and uh, mr lali you know sagar in fact uh, not only came in handy for a lot of these countries during covid-19 uh, it also showed them you know a large part of india's intent of uh, you know to put it very Sim simply of getting along and that's exactly you know how India differs from China you know China uses these nations to its own advantage and to perhaps rile up India at some level but India's intentions are more mature India's intentions are more stable India's intentions in fact invite longevity uh, thank you Vineet uh it's such a pleasure and honor for me to be here among such a distinguished panel and simply taking forward Ambassador Goyal's point, which was the word Indian subcontinent. And Major General Devedi said it's the stabilizing factor. Uh, I, in the same breath, say that one thing that absolutely differentiates us with China is that their ideology is the wolf warrior diplomacy, as the name explains it. And our Mool Sanskar or our Vicharadhara comes from Vasudev Kutumbukam. So I think that itself 
defines how we feel and they feel. But we need, uh, you know, as they say, we can't change uh, neither history nor geography. So uh, India is a mammoth uh, influence in this part of the world. And uh, in this uh, swearing in ceremony, I see two large messages. Uh, one is external and one is internal. The external has been that, you know, as if now the China influence is very strong. I mean, out of the seven countries that are invited, if I would just briefly say that, you know, Sri Lanka is in the Chinese debt trap. I mean, the Maldivian president, you know, they had a campaign called India Out. And Bangladesh did a campaign. It was in themselves can't, you know, boycott India. And uh, even uh, Bhutan and uh, Nepal have been under indirect Chinese influence. So obviously, this is a great act, a great effort by the Modi dispensation to bring all of them under one roof so that it sends a positive message. And of course, the only two companies that countries that are missing are China, I mean, are Pakistan, and you know. And obviously, we haven't heard back from Pakistan. I mean, our our prime minister was still gracious enough to congratulate on the whatever thing called a rigged election. That Mr. Lali, in fact, but on the contrary, they did respond. <laughs> the foreign ministry in Pakistan went on to say that until the oath happens, we are not sure whether Modi is coming back as prime minister or not. That's exactly what uh, Pakistan said. Okay, then I stand corrected. We need the second message. No, I that is just to highlight how immature they are. Uh, I mean, you know, as I always say, that's a country in in in, uh, in, a, in a crisis which is called an identity crisis. So they don't know what they want to do. But having said that, but we need, as we speak, as if now for the last five days, the the, the Pakistani president and the army chief are in China. I mean, they are there too with their begging bowl, which is what they call Kushkol, and we're looking at their Belt Road Initiative, which in which China has the Pakistan has taken China for a royal right. But we I'll, I'll get to the second point, which is there is a great internal message by the Modi government too, because despite in you know, having less seats and being in a coalition government, I think there is an indirect message that that the Modi government is still in control of the foreign policy because you know there is a lot of portfolio allocation and a lot of twos and fro's going on but in foreign policy has been very close to Mr. Modi's heart. So I think there is also a message that not only is the Modi government, despite the coalition, still in control, but also there will be business as usual. So the foreign policy post the G20 will still be the same. And, uh, you know, the other thing I want to say is that it is Pakistan's loss for not being here because they are struggling and they are paying a lot more for everything that they ought to do cheaper. So I think there is an internal and an external message, which is that despite the coalition government, despite all of that, what we've seen, the Modi government is still in control and the foreign policy is going to be still the same as it was post G20. Hmm. Right. Pathikrit, in fact, the economic development that uh, uh, you know the prime minister has been aiming for is up for a higher growth rate. And this is something which uh, is only sustainable if, if India realizes the importance of its neighbors, regardless of the skirmishes that happen time and again. Well, uh, Vinith, you're absolutely right. Let me first tell you the, the five perhaps more most pivotal points of the Sagar initiative has been number one, security, which also includes the security of the coastal area and the maritime territories. The second and a very important point connected to your issue is the capacity building, especially in areas of economic development and development of, uh, you know, sustainable development technology, indigenous technologies. The third, invariably, will be collective action in areas of natural disasters, piracy, terrorism. Fourth, would in invariably be sustainable development on the larger landscape. And fifth, will be maritime engagements. Uh, see, let me tell you, it is the other way around. I think many of these regional countries uh, realize that the centrality of India does actually give India the advantage in terms of playing a critical role so far as ensuring not just the, you know, the security aspect of the region, but also the economic aspect. Uh, in the last few years, if you see many of the templates that the Prime Minister of India initiated for the people of India, uh, he has offered to many of the smaller regional countries to take it literally free of cost as an idea and implement it in their countries. For example, you know, whether you talk about the jam trinity, Jandhan, Aadhaar, Mobile, connecting it with and how it benefits through direct benefit transfer or how microfinancing through Mudra Yojana 
actually create sustainable livelihood uh, among millions or when it comes to issues like say uh, you know uh, having an ayushman bharat kind of the thing or the importance of developing indigenous capability for vaccines and other things i think many of the countries do realize the importance of india and that's why they do actually you know men ensure that in spite of the challenges they have they they keep a they keep a some kind of a good relation uh, in spite of certain challenges for example yes there is a boycott india uh, you know issue going on in bangladesh but at the same time uh, i think the bangladesh government has been very pro india and if you look at the whole laundry list of things they have recently asked from india in terms of all kinds of commodities which they want to import and procure which will be into millions of tons or the manner in which sri lanka does realize that in spite of the fact that china might be one of the biggest lenders they have when it comes to critical times it is india which benefit, you know helps them out uh, or say in case of maldives i think it's a symbiotic relationship they do realize the economic might of india they do realize that the growth trajectory of india is such that by 2027 it is going to be a 5 trillion dollar economy potentially a 10 trillion dollar economy before 2034 and this country is is willing to share its its good benefits or the fruits of economic growth with other countries without any you know um, strings attached which may not necessarily always be the case with china but having said that we must also accept the reality that indian ocean region is a very critical area of competition today many of these countries today which are which would be coming they at least a section of those countries within their political domain do want to have good relation with india but there would always be another section which would prefer china over india so it is this uh, seesaw battle which will continue these countries will try to take maximum mileage from both the countries from both india and china so all i'm saying is this just we have just as we have an independent foreign policy i think many of these countries will also try to claim that they have their own independent foreign policy they would they have the right to have good relation with china which of course india has never been against all that india has asked is this that do not allow your territory to be used against india's interest by another third country which invariably is china but on a larger scale these countries do realize that right. when it comes to cost benefit analysis they benefit more while having good relation with india at a lesser price or cost than what they actually pay as a price for having good relation with china invariably i think it's a step in the right direction right. but let's not also forget the fact that small issues face off turf battles would continue and these and the tensions would not entirely go away but uh, of course that is what geopolitics is all about right and that master goel pathak uh, you're absolutely right well this policy is also about you know india's adherence sir, to uh, you know and india's commitment to rules based uh, international order uh, particularly something which has been advocated by the united nations uh, united nations convention uh, on the law of the uh c and maritime security india is basically trying to make the most of this relationship and the situation uh vinit is that addressed to me yes sir yeah uh vinit uh, i was just thinking about when uh, i listening to uh selali saying um uh, general duvedi and then parikrit uh parikrit of course has lots of data on his hand therefore is difficult to really respond to what he is saying except saying that yes yes and yes uh the point really here is and i'm saying this out of my own experience of more than 40 years dealing with the uh, international affairs the point here is simply this uh i remember when uh, minister jay shankar used the phrase or he actually used a phrase in his speech by the uh, uh by the prime minister that in terms of india us relationship we need to forget the hesitations of history now what i will say here is that in the case of south asia we need to forget the hesitations of the past and we need to basically be saying that yes it is the indian peninsula it is the indian subcontinent you cannot forget india india has the interest the problem really what what happens is that we like a pendulum we swing from left to right we are either to to the side or we are to overbearing we need to find a right balance without bringing in china all the time I remember how we actually hated to be uh, to to be 
index with Pakistan in our relations in South Asia? Why should our relations with Nepal, with Pakistan, with Sri Lanka be all the time? You can't forget China, but we don't need to bring China all the time into our bilateral relations. Security of Sri Lanka and uh, India is Indian Ocean security. And that's a reason we should think of each other in terms of and in terms of really developing the security, which is what Sagar is all about, security of all in the region. And therefore, what I would say is very briefly, the time is very short, that I think it's a right step when we link up our security and our growth with all in the region, particularly in the BIMSTEC and the South Asia region. Those countries which do not uh, come into this matrix, they will realize sooner or later, like Pakistan is, that they will be left behind. And I'm quite certain that as the time goes by, even if uh, Pakistani Prime Minister does not come for the oath ceremony, I'm quite certain that they will realize that they will have to link up economically and commercial trade-wise with India rather than be left alone. Hmm. We need. That's a valid point. We have run out of time as well. We'll take concluding thoughts from the rest of our panelists. Jhul Divedi, I'll start with you. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, so something which is absolutely in the right direction that when it comes to Sagar or even our immediate neighbors, an independent and autonomous policy is what India should work and prevail towards. You know, in fact, we are going to be responding to China on everything. Then India's own personality, India's own disposition when it comes to dealing with our neighbors, in fact, the rest of the world through our foreign policy is also likely to be diluted. Well, when it, every nation puts its own interest on top of the agenda. So whether it's in India or its neighbors, everyone has his own national interest. We need to accept that fact. Secondly, I talked about geography. Geography has certain disadvantages. When you are a big nation, there's always a you know, small nation have the big nation syndrome. Now that we have to somehow manage, that was also with countries like America and other big countries. I think that's where what you know, Ambassador Goyal was trying to bring out, that we need to balance and our relations and ensure that every country has a space to pursue their own national interests. But I like to make out three important points. First and foremost, today India is not confined to South Asia per se. Our strategic interests today are far and wide. We have Act East policy, we have Think West policy, we have Central Asia Connect policy. So therefore, today India should not be seen only in the prism of South Asia, we need to be seen far beyond. And uh, you, we made a point about Pakistan. You know, former ambassador of Pakistan to U.S. had made a very important point, that is Hussain Hakni. He appreciated India's whole system, India's political system, and he had a lot of word of praise. He wrote an op-ed in one of the leading American newspapers. I would only conclude that, see, India has to ensure that its neighbors are at ease with itself, unlike China where the neighbors have serious concern, we must exploit the goodwill. Second is that we must ensure that our national interest and the interest of our neighbors coincide so that there is no conflict. And lastly, as a big nation, we have to have large heart. And at times, when there are certain you know, irritants, we need to resolve with greater maturity. We need. Absolutely right. Mr. Lali, concluding thoughts. Yeah, if I may just take uh, the broader gist of what Major General Devedi and Ambassador Goyal said, not just BIMSTEC, but I think if the world has to prosper, India cannot be ignored. I mean, where else can you find a population of 1.4 billion people under one democratic elected government? So India is too big now to be ignored. Thank you. All right. Good point. Pathikrit? Oh, Vinit, I just want to clarify for one thing. The, the mention of China that I made is not to say that everything that we discussed should have a China point, but it's just a, as a reference so that tomorrow, because what happens suddenly, the expectation of some people rise just because they are being invited. From tomorrow, there is some, some quarters tend to presume that, okay, from tomorrow, they will not have any connection with China at all. That's the only caution I'm trying to say, that they would do because it, it is in their interest. Of course, you are right, and I, I agree with what uh, Ambassador Goel mentioned, that you, you we have to come across that hesitation of the past and go ahead. But also, you know, again, there has everything has to be taken with a pinch of salt. 
because we have the we have a history where sometimes some actions have happened in our immediate neighborhood which have been inimical to india so i think it is uh, i'm not saying it's a it's a seesaw battle but you know everything is a step taken to ensure that you have larger number of friends and less lesser number of adversaries or enemies and i think to that extent the policies of the prime minister in the last 10 years and what he would do in the next 5 years as well is to ensure that those who had some kind of an apprehension towards india in the neighborhood they would also be completely confident that it is in their interest to have much better relation with india than perhaps what they did in the last few years all right Back to you. all right on that note we're going to take a short break would like to thank all my guests for being a part of this wonderful conversation for more such videos subscribe to the newsx youtube channel hit the bell icon